Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is to be here in your house, to glorify your holy name. And whether the numbers is great or few, you always are here among us that we may worship you and that we may learn from you. Father, I set myself aside that you may speak and we may receive and receive with gladness the words that you share. For this time is always your time and we desire to be here to receive the blessing that you pour out. Father, we open our hearts and we open our mind to, to share with you our lives that you may be a part of it, within it, to guide us and to teach us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We're continuing to learn about the purpose of why we celebrate Christmas and how it is so precious and so important that we desire to remember and the desire to celebrate the importance of a promise which God made. And it is such an important event to happen. As much as we can see all desire of people wanting to celebrate this holiday with numerous reasons, we ought not to forget not to forget the true purpose for why we celebrate. I also say upon why we celebrate and what it is we are celebrating, I find that we ought not to forget two people involved who are so important, yet they remain rather almost behind the scene. Almost known very little of. And yet, I find because we don't know very much, a whole lot about them, it is a blessing to see some of the things that we don't know, but we do know. Because they do make a very important impact in our Christ Jesus. Because as I have already said that we're thinking about the promise that God made almost about 500 years before before he came, a, prof a prophecy written in the book of Isaiah. And it was shared from the Lord to a man named Ahaz, Ahaz. This come from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel. That name means God with us. It's a very 
important to hear and to wonder when will this place, how it will take place, what will go on, who's involved. But it was a prophecy given to this man. It was a prophecy given to the world because it was meant for the whole world, not just Israel alone. And it was to invite all who wish to believe and all wish to receive, all wish who to accept. And then some four or five hundred years later, it happens to where an angel named Gabriel, and he is known as an archangel, one of the highest level ranking angels in heaven, who is sent to a town of Galilee in Nazareth. And he visit with a young woman whose name is Mary. And we're going to go for this one book, the book of Luke, give much description about this time. It is also written in Matthew that describes which we are talking about and which we are learning about, which we are celebrating, which we are remembering. But from Luke chapter 1, verse 27, verse 31, the angel Gabriel visits with Mary and says, To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at that saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Jesus, also meaning Emmanuel. And that word means she was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph. And although that time had not come to where they had not been married yet, an angel appeared and said, hey, you are going to be are going to be conceived by the Holy Spirit to give birth to a child. And as we know the story that when he visits her, she is confused because one, she is confused by the visit of an angel, something she never experienced. And to say her as a virgin, she is like, how can it be? I had never known any man. How can this be? I know how pregnancy works. She is thinking to herself. And she is to be known to be a young woman. Oftentimes when a, a female began to receive her period at a young age, she had considered a young woman. And oftentimes when they're young, they often get married quickly. It is imagined, and it is, it is unknown, but it's imagined she could have been like 13, 14, 15 years old and already engaged. For us today, 13, 14, 15, they're still in school. They're not even really yet to be in high school yet. 
as we know today. But over 2,000 years ago, 3,000, 4,000, they got married young. But at the same time, can you imagine what's going through her mind where she's trying to take this all in for an angel to say, you've been chosen. You will conceive. You are the virgin whom this prophecy talks about. Whoa, wow, wait a minute, whoa, me? How can this be? But the angel already said, God found favor in you. He chose you to give birth to the Savior, whom the scriptures have been talking about from Isaiah. You. And she may have known this. She may have been read this by the teachers of the law, those who kept the scripture, those who taught. And at the same time, and it is also unknown, how right away was Joseph informed? For all we know, she did tell, may have told her mother, may have told her father, but one person we knew, know, if we were to continue reading from the book of Luke, that she had found out that her cousin, someone much, much, much older, who was considered barren because she had no children, and she's in her old age, that the angel would tell her that your cousin, Elizabeth, she also is pregnant. And that when she found out about that, she decides she would go visit her. And she already found that Elizabeth was already six months along in her pregnancy. But Mary goes to visit her. Did she tell Joseph right away? It is unknown. The Bible don't say, but Peach imagine she either was told him before or even told him told her husband to be after she returned because when she went and visit and told her sis her cousin that she's pregnant that she had conceived in her the Savior, the Son of the living God. Elizabeth respond that my baby, as soon as she said that, leap, jump with joy. And to know Elizabeth, she is carrying the messenger, the one who is going to prepare the way for Christ to come, the Messiah, whom we know as John the Baptist. That would be Jesus' cousin. He is the baby within the womb of Elizabeth. And he jumped with joy to hear, kicking, kidding, saying, this is the one. And she felt it. She knew it. And they spoke. And she remained, Mary remained with Elizabeth and her husband for three months longer before she returned home to Galilee. And for Joseph himself to find out, we go to Matthew. Chapter 1, verse 19 to 21. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, 
resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and she shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Yes. Here, a just man. He wanted to be righteous. He wanted to walk with God. He wanted to keep God's commandment. He wanted to be a good man. And to hear that his soon-to-be wife, the woman that he is engaged to, being pregnant, and he knows he didn't do anything with her. He was so confused and like, what should I do? He was contemplating to divorce her. And within their law that he was considered, there is three options you have when it comes to a woman committing adultery. And you are engaged to her. They have three choices. You could either publicly divorce her, which is humiliating her, and according to law, their law, that if a woman caught in adultery, she is to be stoned to death. In fact, along with that law, that is two people, because it does take two to commit adultery. They're both to be stoned to death. Or he could divorce her quietly and send her away back to her home, back to her parents, breaking the engagement, the plan to marry. And the third, you can continue to marry her. The angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to say, don't be afraid to take her your wife because she did not commit adultery. Instead, she was conceived by the Holy Spirit. What she said to you was true. And as I said, we know very little about who Joseph is. <clears throat> But well, one thing we do know, he is the father, the stepfather of Jesus. One thing we do know, he is a carpenter. One thing we do know, he is Mary's husband. And he continued to marry her. But what is so special about this whole thing is they remain loyal, humble, and obedient. Even though they can see themselves like, how can this be that God has chosen me to receive Christ? Mary. How can he choose me to give birth to Christ? How can he have chose me in Joseph's mind to care, to protect, to love Christ, the Savior, the one who's going to save us from our sin? You know, it is interesting to me if we were to really notice they didn't go out and brag to everyone, hey, this is my son, and he's going to grow up to be a great man. He's going to be a star. He's going to be famous. You know, we can see that in a lot of people. We can hear that from a lot of people who would like to brag and show off about their child. Hey, this is my son. He's the captain of the football team. Hey, this is my daughter. She's a straight-A student. 
She's on the honorary. She's going to college with a scholarship. He's going to have a successful job. He done this. We can tend to brag and gloat with pride, with envy about our children. Mary and Joseph didn't do that. They didn't. For Mary to give birth, to go for Joseph to have to take Mary to Bethlehem, the city of David, the place of his birth, because he was required to, to register as commanded by Caesar Augustus at the time, the emperor of Rome, saying, go, everybody got to register. That means you have to go back to your place of birth and say that you are here, you were born here. Because they wanted to keep account of all the people. And there, Mary went with him. And when it was time to give birth, upon arriving there, she gave birth. And I bet you she did not expect that she would give birth in a manger. For we can imagine he deserved the best. After all, he's Christ. It is hard to imagine if she complained or she, this is not what it's to be. He should be in a good place, a clean place. He should be born in a house. But she gave birth to him in a manger, almost like a barn. We can think of it as a barn, but it could have been just a place where they kept the animals. It could have been inside a barn like an opening in a wall. And upon giving birth, she was visited by Shepherd, who said, Hey, we heard that the Christ is here. We came to see him. Joseph and Mary didn't tell him, but they welcomed him too. Here he is. And they spoke of him. This is him. And they went out and told. Mary and Joseph did not tell. Did not, they did not say, hey, now that you saw, go tell everybody. But they looked at it and they held heart to what's going on and what could come, what is going to happen, wondering. Same when the Magi came later to visit and saw him and gave him gifts and said, this is the Christ whom we follow the star and this is where the star was above this house that led us to where you are now. She kept dearly to everything. Same for when they took him to the temple that he may be circumcised on his eighth day of his birth. The priest who circumcised them knew who he was. They never spoke a word. A woman who's a prophet, a prophetess, knew who he was, and she came to see him at the temple. She came and she even began to prophesy about him, preach about him, talk about him, that he's going to do this and this and this to all who was there. And we can't even imagine how many was there. But Mary and Joseph did not brag about it. Instead, they received and started to understand he is going to be important. And we must care for him. In fact, for Joseph, 
also later getting in, receiving in the dream after the Magi come to say that the spirit of the Lord came to him again and said, take the boy and his mother and flee from this place. For the king is desiring to kill him. Because the king Herod at that time was a very wicked, evil, jealous person. And for him to find out from the Magi who wanted to know where the Christ was, was not wanting to share his kingdom. Because I said, where is the new king that was born? And he knew there is no king that's going to take my place. That's how evil and greedy he was. And he did. He went out and had those who were two years and younger killed. Because the Magi did not come back to tell him where he was. But Joseph, out of obedience, knew he had to protect Jesus Christ, our Savior. And after the king had died, he came back. To, but he did not just go anywhere. He went to some place where he felt was safe, was with Galilee again. To Nazareth. Take him there. Protect him there. And they raised him up, in which we have no idea how they did it. What they did. What they said. But we can know that they remain humble and true and began to teach him as a child God's words, which is his own word. And I'm going to say, this is what you said in the scriptures. Sometimes I wonder if they said that. What does this mean? What does this talk about Jesus growing up as a child? And I can imagine the other. Well, this means that we are to keep his commandment and remember and follow it and trust him. Actually, you said it. But still, These were parents who walked in humbleness, walked in trust and faith and truth, and remained to do so that they would not corrupt Christ, that they would not profit from Christ. Even though they can still imagine how is I have the responsibility in knowing this, Christ does the same with us. He calls us. He calls us. And we can say to us, why me? How did you choose me to speak about Jesus? I know in my own life, in my own experience, in my own journey, I said that. Out of all the people he can choose, he chose me to speak about him, to preach about him, to share the message about him, to say that the Savior has come, he had done, and we are free, and we can walk with him and be in commune with him. All together, not just one of us, but all of us. And we can do it with that humility that he gives, that he taught. And we can say and say, thank you. Blessed be the parent who has raised it. Blessed be Mary who gave birth to him. Blessed be Joseph who protected him. Even though we know very little of him and what he did, what he said, what he done. And we don't even know what happened to him later on 
when Jesus became a man. Other than the fact that when he became a man at 12 years old is when they consider a boy to become a man. It's, we remember the story that they went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And they spent time there. They walked, went there with a group of people from their city of Nazareth. And upon returning home, Mary and Joseph realized that Jesus is not even with them. What happened to him? Where did he go? We can't find him. But they had to go all the way back to Jerusalem. We don't even know how far they went till they realized he wasn't with them. And when they got to Jerusalem, they searched and searched and searched and found him in a temple, talking among the preachers, talking among the teachers, hearing what they say and explaining to them what he understood. And they were surprised and yet for Mary and Joseph, they were like, we were searching for you. What happened? And Jesus, don't you know I'm supposed to be in my father's house doing my father's business? They may not have understand what he meant and what he said, or but they simply... She, Mary, the mother, just took to heart everything he said to think about it, to dwell on it, to understand it, knowing this is something important that he said. And then said, let's go home. And out of obedience, she's had done so. And we don't hear anything else <clears throat> until he becomes 30. We don't know anything else other than Mary. When he come, when Jesus began his ministry, he already has many of his disciples. He'd been invited to a wedding. They ran out of wine. And Jesus and Mary go to Jesus and says, hey, they ran out of wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what that got to do with me? It ain't my time. And what does she do? She doesn't brag or anything. Oh, she said to her servant, that, ah, whatever he says, do it. And we know the first miracle, he turned water into wine. And when Jesus visited places after places and places and traveled and talked and everything, not one word from Mary saying, hey, that's my son that's doing that. I'm the one that gave birth to him. That's my boy. She did not speak at all with pride and not a day example of a mother, of a father, of a friend, of a neighbor, of a brother, of a sister. To remain humble to what one is doing for the kingdom of God. And I love that. Even to, all the way to the point that Jesus is on the cross. Mary was there watching her son hang from the cross in pain and agony, bleeding, Cuts and everything, scarred all over him, wearing a crown of thorn upon his head. She looked upon him with tears, and she did not speak a word. A mother could say, or a father can say, to see their son being punished for something especially something they did not do, and say, this should not be. But for Mary, 
who can imagine what's going on in her mind? Has this come to be? Is this it? Is this how his life is to be? I cannot let, I cannot stop it because it is God's will. Even though I probably did not expect it to happen like this for him to go through the pain. But he is Christ. And he has come to save us. And he has come to lead us, to teach us. And that we may remember and be with him. For even on this time that we do not know the parents so well, what we do know is they did it out of humility. They did it out of love. They did it out of obedience. And they did it for Christ, for the Lord who called them to do so. Even though they can imagine it shouldn't be me. It should have been somebody else. But just as Lord, our Lord blessed them with the task, he blesses us with the task as well to share about him, to allow him to go before us. And to say, this is him. Let him have his way do his will. And let me tell you about him and what he thinks of you. What he desires of you, what he gives to you, the gifts of salvation. The greatest gift that we can receive, especially on Christmas Day. For when he came into the world for us to save us. How I praise God for all he done, for all he's given, for his love and his mercy that we did not even deserve, but he loved us that much, so much more than we can imagine. Let us bow our head and praise and give thanks to what our Father done. Father, we thank you for the promise that you fulfilled, that you kept by sending your son Jesus, who's also called Emmanuel, which also means God with us. That you not only came born as a man, walked among us, but allow us to see your presence, your spirit, to know you. We thank you for the parents you had that you chose to care for Jesus, to protect him, to bring him up. And how you saved them just as you saved us. Lord, we continue to celebrate this special time, this special holiday for the gift of salvation that you've given us. And may you give us strength and courage to go out and be able to share and to celebrate just for that purpose of why we celebrate Christmas and why it is so important that we remember And that it draws us closer. That we can be as a, a whole temple. 
a church, a communion with you in your kingdom, that we may see your light now and forever. Lord, we desire to continue to praise you and to love you, to give you everything we are, to be who you desire us to be, and to share about who you are. Lord, we continue to praise and glorify your name with all of our hearts, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.